Cricket Life Stories with me, Neil Kagram, and today we are at Lords, the home of cricket. Very, very lucky today to be given an exclusive sit down with the curator of collections at Lords, Neil Robinson. He's going to give a brief history of the ground and talk us through this famous old place. Hope you enjoy it. So 1787 and Thomas Lord, talk us through how it all began. Well, MCC really grew out of another club called the White Conduit Club, who played at uh, a ground called White Conduit Fields in North London. And it was um, inhabited by many of the, the great aristocratic cricket playing patrons of the, the game at the time. The people who would gamble a thousand guineas of their own fortune on an individual game of cricket. Um, but one side track of that was having a lot of wealthy people in one place attracted a lot of thieves. The, the turnpike heading north out of London that the ground was quite close to was famous for highwaymen and there were pickpockets and petty thieves hanging around the area as well. So the, the players there felt quite insecure and they asked Thomas Lord, who was a player, an attendant on the ground, also a budding entrepreneur, um, they asked him to, to go out and find them a more secure location to play their cricket. And they guaranteed him against any finan financial loss in, in doing so. Um, he eventually found a, a plot of land on the Portman Estate in West London, um, on what's now Dorset Square, just yep. north of Oxford Street. Um, he laid out his ground, built a pavilion, built a wine shop and made sure all the players and spectators had to leave through the wine shop. Um, which added to his profits. So that and was 1787? That was 1787. And that's how MCC was born in the parish of, of Marylebone. Um, most of the White Conduit players moved over and the White Conduit Club gradually died. MCC became its replacement and became the most fashionable and popular cricket club in London at the time. And a year later, the Code of Laws were implemented. That's right, that was really just a natural follow-on from the function those gentlemen of the White Conduit already enjoyed. The, the men who were gambling the most on cricket matches were the men who wanted the laws in place to ensure that everybody played by the same set of rules. So it was very natural that those gentlemen, now being the men behind MCC, you know, MCC should be the, the law-giving institution uh, in the game of cricket, and it's remained that way ever since. And now, you know, the, the ground that we sit in today, it's actually the third ground, isn't it? That's right, yes. Um, the, the point about the, the first ground that Lords built, it was quite close to the centre. It was still handy for everyone to get to, but London was expanding a lot at the time and the, the, the price of property was rising, which is something we're still familiar with today. The Portman Estate, um, as the lease was coming towards its end, um, about 20 years after the ground was opened, they were putting the rent up for a, an extended lease. Thomas Lord thought that that was going to eat into his profits too much, so he, he found another plot of land um, on the Air Estate, slightly further north, up a road that's now called Lisson Grove, roughly halfway between the old location and this current one. He opened a the ground there in 1809, which was before MCC actually vacated the original ground, so for a couple of years there were two Lord's grounds operating at once. But in 1811, MCC finally moved to the second ground. The trouble was they didn't like it very much. The location wasn't as nice. There wasn't a decent tavern nearby. It really wasn't very popular. And cricket itself was having a bit of a slump at the time and not so many matches being played. So when Parliament announced that they were going to drive the new Regent's Canal right through the middle of Lord's new ground, he really wasn't that disappointed. He pocketed a healthy sum in compensation and actually got the air estate to find him a, a new location, which is right here where we are now in the parish of St John's Wood. Even though we're in St John's Wood, we remain the Marylebone Cricket Club. Sounds like a very savvy businessman as well. He certainly was. In fact, his, his last trick actually came just shortly before he retired in 1823. Um, he decided it was time for him to move on. He wanted to retire to, to Hampshire and he actually got permission from the air estate to develop housing on the outfield. Uh, it wouldn't have covered the whole ground, but it would have been enough to make cricket really pretty impossible to carry on in the current location. But luckily, um, the club itself was horrified, and one of its prominent members, a man called William Ward, who was a director of the Bank of England, MP for the City of London, actually bought Lord's interest out, paid him £5,400, took over the lease of the ground himself, and saved Lord's for cricket. So you might say we should be called Ward's rather than Lord's. And in terms of, you know, Lords is actually synonymous for the famous pavilion as well. Again, that's, you know, what we see today. That's not the original pavilion. 
It isn't. The original pavilion that was built on this site by Thomas Lord, coincidentally enough, actually didn't survive long after he departed the ground. In 1825, shortly after the, an Eaton v Harrow match, um, a fire started and the whole pavilion burned down, including all the club's early records. So. You know, we have very little that's written down from our earliest years in existence. We have no written record of our early club presidents or early officers. Um, I think at the time the members were more concerned about the loss of one of the finest wine cellars in London, but as a historian it's the loss of all that early archival paperwork that we really miss. And Middlesex County Cricket Club, they used to call this place their home as well. How did that come about? Um, it was fortunate really for both parties. Um, county cricket really began to take off in the 1860s and the, the county program began to become an increasingly important part of cricket in England at the time. It was beginning to attract a lot more spectators. But Lords didn't have a county team playing in, uh, on its ground at, um, at the time in the 1860s. Middlesex played most of their early matches at a place called Prince's Club in West London, quite close to where Harrods sits now. Um, and there were a couple of overtures made by MCC for Middlesex to come and base themselves here around the end of the 1860s, early 1870s, but they, they demurred on both occasions. Um, and it was only in 1876 when Prince's Club was actually, it was beginning to struggle financially, it needed refurbishing, the state of the buildings really wasn't suitable for a club as prominent as Middlesex. MCC made a third offer and in November 1876 Middlesex accepted and since the start of the 1877 season this has been their home. So from that Middlesex got a permanent home for, for their cricket and Lords and MCC got a tenant who would bring in regular high quality high profile cricket onto the ground and, and help pay the ground's bills. So it's really been a, a very successful partnership ever since. And the first test match to take place here? Well the first test match to take place here interestingly enough wasn't the first test match in England. So when we played the centenary test here in 1980 we were actually commemorating a match that had taken place at the Oval a hundred years earlier. We were four years later, 1884, um, but we've held test matches regularly here ever since. Uh, quite often we have two test matches, two test matches yeah. a year. In fact, um, was it nine years ago when we held the Spirit of Cricket test match here, Pakistan versus Australia, we had three test matches that year. So we have become certainly the, the ground that uh, people associate test cricket with in, in England and most touring teams that, that visit this country, they definitely want to play at Lords. And obviously there's been some absolutely fantastic performances throughout the years. How highly do you rank 1924, was it Sir Don Bradman? 1930, his, his first test match here. Well, that, that was a fantastic match and fantastic innings for Bradman. Um, when you think about Don Bradman, statistically pretty much twice as good as anyone else who's ever played it as a test batsman. For him to say that that one innings he played here at Lords in 1930, where he made 254, was the best innings he ever played because every ball went exactly where he wanted it to go. That really is quite a statement from a, a man of that record. Um, very few people alive these days will remember it and the, the footage you'll, you'll see on um, you know, Pathé Newsreel or anything like that is, is very limited so it's hard to know from our point of view exactly how good an innings it was. You've only got to look at um, Bradman's record though to, to know that it must have been something pretty special. And in your opinion, are the great performances that take place here? We could probably talk all day about the number of great matches that have been here. I, I can probably talk about great performances, great matches I've seen. Um, historically speaking, I'd, I'd maybe go back to 1934, um, which was the last time England beat Australia for 75 years in a test match here at Lords. Headley Verity took 14 wickets in a day across two innings to, to bowl the Australians to defeat. What a performance that must have been. Um, you think about the West Indians' famous victory here in 1950, just when the Windrush generation had arrived on these shores, and it was really just, it was, a statement of arrival for the West Indian community in this country as well as a great test match victory in which West Indies cricket came of age. Think of the 1983 World Cup when India surprisingly defeated the West Indies in the final, uh, a match which probably changed the course of cricket's future in that it, it stimulated this massive interest in the one day game that's taken off in India ever since. Um, you can probably look at the Women's World Cup here a couple of years ago, 2017, a fantastic final, a, a great game of cricket, not just a great game of women's cricket. Um, and that's, that stunning final with Anya Shrubsell taking, taking the wicket just after a catch had been dropped off, off her bowling. Um, that was a remarkable game um, and also 
who can forget this year in particular that that One final great, super yeah. over England and New Zealand in the World Cup final. Um, this ground is just dripping with moments like that. It's a remarkable place to be. You mentioned their one day cricket. Mm. How receptive were the MCC in terms of, you know, bringing the one day game? Well, don't forget, in. 1963, MCC ran the game in this country. Of course. It was an MCC initiative. Um, MCC has always been aware of, of the, the condition of the game and has always sought to, to make sure its future is secure. And while after the Second World War there had been an initial boom in, in cricket, in, in spectator interest as people sought to get back to normal, that had sort of ebbed away during the 1950s and by the early 1960s there was a, a strong sense in cricket that something had to be done to get the crowds back in. And it, it was MCC's work, a working party was put together to devise a knockout cricket competition. Eventually Gillette was brought on board as, as the sponsors and the Gillette Cup was born. So people often think of MCC as, as a sort of old fashioned institution, but it, if, if you look back through history, it's quite often been at the forefront of a lot of innovations. And so I asked that question because of, there's a lot of controversy about the Packer era. Mm. Um, was there any kind of... Well, that, that was, that, it, it, the Packer era was a very difficult time for cricket because it, it was... The breakaway. It was a breakaway. It was a time when the power of television began to assert itself. It was a, a time when really the, the aesthetics of cricket began to change as well. If you look at how Packer markers the game um, and all the coloured clothing, the white ball, the razzmatazz that goes along with that, that's when that came that began to come in. The best players in the world. The best players in the world were taken away from the, the regular programme of cricket, yeah. of international cricket in particular. Um, and it, it really was a, a wrench between the existing powers um, at the time. Uh, it, MCC at the time had handed over power to, to the Test and County Cricket Board in this country, but we still had a voice on that board, a very strong voice. And naturally, when something like that happens, it, you know, the, there is a, a lot of argument, a lot of discussion to go through. The case obviously went to court. Luckily, in the end, you know, Packer and the Australian board came to an arrangement um, after three years and peace was restored. The, the players who'd been denied an opportunity for that time to play official test cricket came back into the fold. And cricket more or less came back to normal, but with a lot of Packer innovations Including not, it, yeah. not just the visible things like coloured clothing, but even innovations like the the fielding circles, the the fifteen yard circle yeah. in a in one day cricket, which was really brought in worldwide by the influence of Packer, even though it started in South Africa in the nineteen sixties. So Packer was a very influential man in that respect, but it was a case where cricket definitely was changed by revolution rather than evolution. And you talk about MCC also moving with the times. Talk about the membership as well. Yeah. So only recently women were allowed into, uh, into the pavilion. That, that's a very interesting point. Um, we, it's curious looking back to the 1990s when the, the issue of women membership really came to a head and we had the, the two votes in 1998 which eventually we had a, a, a sufficient majority of members voting in favour. Both votes actually went in favour but the, the first one didn't attain a large enough majority to change the club rules. The second one did and women were admitted as members. There hadn't actually been anything specific in the club rules to ex exclude women, um, but it was merely a convention that no women had been admitted as members in the history of the club. And uh, as you say, women were extremely restricted in their presence in the pavilion, particularly on major match days. Even though we had women members of staff who might be working in the pavilion, they couldn't go into the It was only the right. Queen that was... Yeah, allowed in, wasn't certain it? exceptions were made, Her, Her Majesty naturally being, being one of them. Um, but it, it, it was definitely another of those occasions when MCC realised it, it was yeah, going to fall behind the times. I think there was only one county cricket club left outside of Lords where women were, no long, were not yet admitted to, to the club's pavilion. So it was high time for a change. And, and was it an R. Flint that, that put the vote in? Um, it was. Rachel Hayhoe Flint, yeah. the famous captain of the England yeah. women's cricket team. Um, and she and put it in because, so no one knew her gender, is that correct? Um, she, she did put it in like that, uh, fairly anonymously, but at the same time, um, I think she wrote to the president at the time, Lord Griffiths, to explain her actions. 
and there, there was a conversation, I think MCC was slightly caught on the back foot at the time by this application, but it did start a conversation um, between the, the senior executives in the club and the membership that eventually led seven or eight years later to the admission of women um, to membership of MCC. And I think to the club's cre credit, it's actually worked pretty hard since then. Um, very quickly, we admitted the first set of Honorary Life members, um, prominent women cricketers and administrators, and very quickly we set up the first playing section for the club. And in fact, most of the women members now have actually qualified as playing members rather than through the, the traditional route of, of being nominated and uh, waiting several years on the waiting list. It's only in the last couple of years that the, the first women members have, have actually achieved full membership of the club through that uh, waiting list, which as everyone knows is extremely lengthy. Yes, about what, 25, 30 years? 29 years at the moment, I understand. Years, okay. Yes, it's quite, quite a time to wait. And how many members are there in total? Around 18,000? Um, we have 18,000 full members and about 5,000 um, associate members. So we're, we're just over 23,000 in total, I believe. And this great ground, you know, continually innovating, 1999, the media center. That's right. It's kind of, you know, the old historic ground, but you're also bringing in the new. It's, it's a curious balance that this place manages to strike. As you say, 20 years since the media centre was built, who'd have thought that, that such a radical and innovative building at the time would have become seen as one of the Was icons? there any objections by anyone or was I, it supportive from, by all? I, th I think there are always different voices, um, but the club as a whole, I think, was supportive of, of this design. And from a practical point of view, it was really the only practical design because when you think about, you know, we'd only just built the Compton and Edrich stands a few years earlier at the time. The gap between them was essential to allow access onto the field for the, the ground staff and their equipment for drying out the ground, cutting the grass and so forth. Um, there wasn't enough space in that gap for a media centre to, to be built strictly between, uh, between those two stands. And there wasn't room in the pavilion to accommodate all of the world's media for the 1999 World Cup plus all the members that wanted to watch the cricket. So in order to get the media behind the, the bowler's arm, we needed a design that was going to float above those two stands. And that meant it was always going to be a radical design that looked very different from anything else that had stood at the ground before. But I think one thing we've always managed to achieve at Lords is when a new development takes place, a great, not only does a great deal of thought go into to its design so that it doesn't take away from anything else that, um, that is already on the ground. But also, we tend to do things step by step, rather than, as might happen in another ground, everything gets knocked down and, and rebuilt afresh, at which point you just lose any sense of heritage that you have. Here, because we, we do things step by step, a building like the Media Centre has a chance to absorb itself into the atmosphere of Lords and become part of the scenery before anything else changes. So people can still look around and see things that are familiar. They can still feel that they're in a familiar place. And that way, it doesn't lose the heritage that makes it feel such a special place to be. And in 2005, the, the media rights went away from terrestrial TV. Mm. There was a bit of controversy that the MCC didn't support um, or supported the ECB in the fact of taking it off free to air. Any, any comment on that? <sighs> That's really before my time, and I, I don't really have anything I can say on that subject, I'm afraid. Yeah, and obviously this is one of the few grounds in the, in the world, I believe, that the spectators are allowed to bring in alcohol. Wasn't there like a, a, some, some steps by the, the ICC that were trying to, trying to, trying to ban this? I, I think, Lords, we've been lucky that there is a recognition that we are a special venue with a special atmosphere. If you look around gardens like the Coronation Garden on... Uh, a test match day, that picnicking sense is, is still very much part of the atmosphere of Lords. The same sort of thing happens at the nursery ground. Um, it's, it's nice that Lords has that exception from uh, the, the general way of doing things around the world because it is a very special place. And MCC's role in the game moving forward, mm. test cricket, a lot of people are saying it's dying. With the advent of 2020 cricket, you've mm. got the 100 coming up. Where's the MCC's role? Again, in, it's in enhancing, bringing new, the new audience in, mm. but also satisfying um, the purists and you know, ensuring that the game as a whole um, stays united mm. as such. Well, of course, MCC doesn't 
run the game in, in the way that, uh, that it used to 50 odd years ago and, and earlier. But it, it, it's, it's still, got a significant role there, hasn't it? Still, it, still? You know, it acts as a, a strong, of the independent game. voice. We we still control the laws which aren't specific to Test cricket or any other kind of cricket, but they're meant to be applicable at all levels, from the Test arena to the Village Green. And of course, the spirit of cricket, as you say, um, we're, we're very strongly committed to, to promoting the fact that the cricket should be played in a proper, hard but fair manner. Um, we, I think, we have a balance to strike between promoting innovation in the game as we always have, allowing the game to evolve. No game can ever survive if it just stays static. Um, but we have to try and preserve those elements within the game that are best. It, it's a difficult, difficult thing to do when the world is changing so rapidly. Um, but all MCC can do is, is try and promote all the things that are best in cricket and acknowledge that sometimes, you yeah, know, you need to do new things, you need to innovate radically in order to keep the game alive. And I think MCC has established itself as a, a body that is, that is willing to, to make that case for innovation and preservation simultaneously so that the game can take the best of itself going forward and it will always go forward. Neil Robinson, thank you very much. You're welcome.